Uh, today I would like to I try to be in time. So, uh, <clears throat> the importance of microanatomy in central skull based surgery of tumors, uh, of course, you have to know how to come to, sorry, uh, how to come to the these cliffs where the tumors are, you see. And I think I don't like to convince you on anything what I will say. But you have to agree with me that the normal anatomy was the first. That in this normal anatomy, the tumor grows in. So if we do not know normal anatomy, then we cannot understand pathological anatomy, that is changed anatomy after the tumor developed. And this is so-called central skull base uh, area where many things are hidden. And uh, I consider meningiomas the most difficult task in this region. If we go first to the diaphragm cell and optic canals meningiomas, which are very few, so far in all my practice, I only have eight cases. And for this, we have to know where is the optic nerve, where is the mucous membrane over the sphenoid sinus, where is the distal ring, the proximal ring, and where the nerves are. And when we open these membranes, what we find, how the artery is coursing, and we will be sure that we have not to enter me, uh, mucous membrane. I'm still very much afraid of CSF leak. This is for me a serious complication, and it should not happen. So we have to know this region very well before we start dealing with meningiomas. You may say, okay, these are your old slides. Of course. But this is the anatomy as I found in the lab and as I found every day in uh, surgeries in uh, this region. This is a case of a optic canals meningiomas. A lady which came to me because her vision on one side was deteriorating and uh, was about 75% down. On the other eye, she was still okay. We take the tumor away and we were able to save this vision on uh, that eye. And then I tried to convince her to operate also on the other side. She said, no, 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 I'm afraid. I have normal vision on, on the other side, and I have preserved vision on this side. I said, I may be somewhere else in the world, and you will start losing vision on the, on the healthy eye. But she didn't agree with me. So it happened that we operated on this uh, first, you see, we removed this is the optic nerve in optic canal, and then we follow the optic nerve into the canal. And as you can see, the optic nerve is rough here because the tumor was very much attached. And there is the changed surface of the optic nerve, while here is normal, and also in the orbit is practically normal. As you can see here now, you see? This is in the orbit already, and this is intradurally, and here it was compressed in the very canal. But with this gentle technique, opening the optic canal and freeing the optic nerve, we were able to, uh, we were lucky, we were happy to preserve the vision. And then I went to the States where I operated sometimes, and I had lined up operations and on the very day when I came to the States she phoned me. Now sir, 
On the second eye, I'm losing the vision. Uh, when I came back after 10 days, uh, we immediately operated on her, but she lost the vision on the healthy eye. Now she's living on that, that eye where she started losing the vision. So it is important to act as soon as possible. Uh, and this is one patient who came to me and he said, I'm blind on the right side. I have a sun vision and I'm losing the vision on the, on the left side. You see the carotid? And then we open the canal again, the same, and then we make free the optic nerve and the, uh, the patient was uh, uh, preserved in the vision. And then he convinced me, a year later, he said, but let's try on the right side. Maybe the vision will come back. And you know how difficult it is to push the frog into the pond. I, I then went and we operated on him. But you see how changed is the nerve already. And then this is after uh, removal of the tumor. Now the nerve was preserved, but very compressed, you see but the function did not come back. And recently, I had a, another patient, a lawyer, who lost her vision on one eye 17 years ago. And she was told that it just happened. And now she started losing vision on the, the other eye. So we again we operated on her, and we were lucky again she is able to use this vision on this uh, operating side. Now, sphenoid link and anterior climate process meningiomas. We have to be very careful about the sphenoid link, which may be hyperostotic sometimes, and we have to remove, of course, everything, and we have to open the optic canal, and then also if it goes into the carbonyl sinus. And here is postoperative. However, I may be uh, uh, advocating the, the removal of the anterior canine process uh, the most, but at the same time, we have to be aware of pneumatization of the anterior canine. If you remove in this case the anterior canine, you will open the way for the CSF. And that's why we have to be careful with such cases where we have a tumor around the anterior climate. You can dream of only the outer part, only the outer part, like this. You, you shouldn't dream like this. You have to dream very, very carefully around. So that the a uh, pneumatized part remains untouched. You see here, even better, the pneumatized. And then we go to the, the other tumors in this region. And as it was said already by Luc de Valle, you don't need to remove the last piece of the tumor. I was maybe sometimes also too aggressive. But why? We have a also radio surgery after all. And if you leave a little bit of the tumor there, it doesn't matter. You just follow it later on. But you see, here the same, and the mass of the tumor is removed. This is venous stasis because of the compression of the tumor. And here is almost subtotal removal of the tumor. Another case, before surgery and after surgery, complete removal. Another one with incomplete removal. There is a little bit of tumor. I consider it too dangerous to go uh, to the last piece. Uh, another case, and this after surgery. Tuberculous cerebellagiomas. Uh, I think it's a, quite an interesting topic. 
This is not a difficult uh, uh, topic. However, we have to be aware what are the structures and how we approach these structures. So I always prefer to come from the side. And uh, then I do this usual opening. This is the orbit, frontal lobe, and the civilian fissure here. So then we uh, go on both sides. We come in and we visualize the tumor. And it is easy to go from the side and at the base and to remove the tumor. Another one, and back to the complete removal. You see here and there, and uh, this tumor goes, of course, over the diaphragm cell, and you can come all down and you remove everything. That's this, and what is important is to realize how the tumor does compress the optic, actually the visual apparatus, from front, from medial side, from above, from below, and then the very important compression is also from the anterior uh, cerebral artery. You see what the damage it does uh, on the optic nerve. And that's why you have to be very careful not to damage it further. You see, this is this damage of the optic nerve over the chiasm and uh, you can safely remove everything and show the left optic nerve and the pituitary stock and everything. Uh, this is another very big case. This patient was operated somewhere else. They spent eight hours on this tumor and they actually did not remove it. They were just digging into the brain. They lost a lot of a lot of blood, and that's why they actually removed both frontal lobes. You see, and they left the tumor inside. So after our, our operation from the side, we were able to remove everything and also to preserve the vision. Mitochondria for some minutes. Some people like to sell these tumors as the cavernous sinus tumor, but this is not the cavernous sinus. This is growing from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, or so called paracellar space. Another case, this is not cavernous sinus, this is lateral wall. Cavernous sinus is still free, so you can eradicate it completely. The same case, paracellar space or so-called cavernous sinus meningiomas. They are completely in the cavernous sinus. Here, you have to be very careful not to damage and not to devascularize the nerves. And this is a nice picture. But the question is, does the nerve, the nerve's functions, uh, are, are they preserved? And this is not seen on this picture. Now, meningiomas of the paracellar space and adjacent areas regions. These are the most frequent and uh, more, uh, the highest number. How we do this? We still care for the aesthetic of the patient, and we think that it is good if you preserve the insertion of the temporalis muscle on the bone flap. So then we shape it this way, and then we break the bone laterally, and the, the temporalis muscle is not detached from the bone. Because we think if it is detached from the bone, it never ever comes back normally. But if you have a so-called uh, osteomuscular flap, then the temporalis muscle has its function after surgery. And then we go anteriorly, we go at the optic 
area, send a wing, we removed it, you see, until the time process, and then finally we come to the lateral wall. Then we remove everything from this side so we have access from front, and then we visualize also the, the carotid, optic strut is here, optic nerve is here, there's a lateral wall, no retraction, and then we go further and we go from the posterior side, we unroof first the carotid, ICA at the posterior loop, you see, and then we come to the posterior fossa, where we see the seven and eight nerve, and the apex of the pyramid is there, and we can drill it very nicely all over. Oh, sorry, I didn't translate this, uh, this, but it goes like this. The eyes do not see what the brain doesn't know. So if we know what we are looking for, then we will see it. If we are pulled by the tumor into the space, we are then just waiting what will occur in front of us. For that reason, we have to know the normal anatomy. And that is to know the anatomy of the nerves, the anatomy of the artery, and of course the complex relationship. Where the sixth nerve is, they say, oh, this is not so important, you will find the sixth nerve. Of course, you will find it. But the best way is to know that inferolateral trunk is crossing over the sixth nerve. So in this way, you will never mix the sixth nerve for the sympathetic trunks. And uh, you have to be aware of the fixation of the carotid artery to the bone. Dural ring and proximal ring. And when you cut this, and then you go circumferentially, you can lift the carotid and you can visualize the uh, uh, front part of it. And then how is it in the canal, in the bony canal in the pectoral bone? And then when you know this anatomy of the of the paracellar space and of the surrounding areas, then you can eradicate these these tumors from the middle fossa, posterior fossa and the cavernous sinus. You see before and after. Similar case before and after. Again, similar case before and after. Then we come to the more difficult uh, problems, and this is when the artery is narrower as it is normal. I was questioning myself, is this only compression or this, is this invasion of the tumor into the cerulea dentitia, into the muscularis? And we found, uh, uh, with, together with pathologists, that this is invasion. And what we do, when we are too aggressive in such cases, we remove the tumor from the, from the artery, and then we have additional readings and we coagulate such an artery wall and then we devascularize uh, the artery wall and we may have a, a rupture. So if there is such situation and if you are not in position to put a short high flow graph or if you are afraid uh, when the patient is young and this is dominant hemisphere, just leave a small sleeve of the tumor over the artery. The artery will expand, and if the tumor will grow later on, you can hit it with radiosurgery. And in particular, when you have a, such a situation where on this side where the tumor is, we have almost no anterior cerebral artery. And uh, so we have no cross flow. And if we stop the flow here, if we are not successful with reconstruction, 
then the middle server artery is gone. So uh, we have to know this thing before. This is a patient operated somewhere else before and uh, was told that nothing can be done because the tumor was very hard. And then we operated and we had a rupture of the carotid and we had to put a uh, cuff clip and we had to reconstruct the carotid end to end. And it, is, uh, it was successful. We have a arterial tree. We have a not so big tumors, but extending along the dural areas from the cavernous sinus here and then back part, you see. Uh, you, do not, you do not need to go to the very last end. We left a piece of tumor here because otherwise we should retract the temporal lobe too much. And then we follow this. What is this? This is not calcification. This is ossification in the meningioma. And these are extremely hard and difficult to remove. Petroclava and Dorello's space meningiomas. Uh, you can see here, and then you see after removal. This is lateral view for the same case. You see the brain stem is this is placed. And this is how it looks like. You come from the lateral side, and then you see here the artery, and then you can remove the anterior plant, the, the posterior uh, uh, part of the bone, that is apex of the pyramid, and we remove from here the tumor. And you could say, oh, this is not good. But this is not good because we still have the tumor here. And that's why you have to go on the front side of the root of the fifth nerve. Cassarium ganglion is here. And you have to remove also the tumor from this area. And you, you cannot be satisfied with this because there is still the tumor. And only after removal of the tumor you can visualize the sixth nerve from the brain stem to the cavernous sinus and then by opening the Doreno space, it is written Doreno's canal, but I named it the space because this is much wider. And uh, then you eradicate the tumor completely. Posterior gland process and those who say that, and upper clavar meningiomas, uh, we have to be aware of the normal anatomy of the posterior climbing process. And when we know this, then we know where we will enter the sinus and where we will have a bleeding and so on. And this is such a case, the tumor before and the situation afterwards. Another one, before and after. And then here, more central, you see the attachment, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The attachment to the tumor is only, was only there. Sorry. You see, only here was the attachment. Very little one. And then growing there. So the removal of this was not, is another case. Again, this is upper climber. This is not a difficult task. Even uh, that the, the brain stem is very much compressed. But when you go from the lateral side, when you remove the posterior climbing process, you come underneath and then you devascularize the tumor. And then the rest of the work is very easy. And then you don't damage the brain stem because you are coming from the tumor side. If it's too adherent, you leave it. But here it was the greenish line between the brain stem and between the tumor. Another more nasty tumor at this region. You see, it went over the diaphragm, comes anteriorly on the plano, and then it goes to the upper plano. And it was possible to remove it completely without damage. Now, this is more serious situation, but still, you can approach this 
from two sides, from above and from lateral posterior side. And then you can again remove completely. But you see, there is clean shine between the brain stem and the tumor vessels, and uh, you can remove it completely. This is not good. This patient was operated already three times, and the surgeon, before he was operating the picture more than the patient, and all the nerves were damaged. Then the patient came to me. I said, but what can I do now? Uh, and then the uh, family said, but try to do something. And of course, I was not able to be radical. I had to leave a part of the tumor because it was extremely hard. But at least we were able to release the brain stem and uh, to uh, reduce the volume of the tumor. Now, pituitary tumors extending beyond the cellar, uh, I'm not against transphenoidal, please don't understand me wrongly, but I think sometimes transcranial approach is needed. And this is such a case. Uh, he had twice already operation transphenoidal, a professor of agronomy. And this is another case. Also, we approached from transcranial, and we were able to remove it completely. Now, transgenital neurinomas. I think you may have a large transgenital neurinoma before it gives any symptomatology. And uh, on the other side, you may have a smaller one. And you may have a distribution in the middle fossa and the posterior fossa. You see? Or only the posterior fossa, growing from the root of the transgenital nerve. You still can remove this by Terrional approach, a little bit extended. You have another case of this tumor. How to approach to this tumor? Because it, there were the, the suggestions to put the drainage first because the patient had the, already the hydrocephalus. I said, no, with the removal of the tumor, we will also solve the problem of hydrocephalus. And we did. And then we have another case a little bit larger tumor, which was removed completely from this approach. You see? Another one. These tumors sometimes also bleed, and then all of a sudden the patient has very, very strong pain. And we have to be aware when we are dealing with the apex of the pyramid. Where the tumor is, there is also realization of the apex of the pyramid. So be careful, look carefully where the fish is. Hordomas, homosacomas, and hondromas. I think you agree that this tumor is compressing too much the brain stem, and we need to remove it at least great part, then the rest can be hit by proton beam, not by gamma, by proton beam. And we have a very good cooperation with uh, uh, this group at Mass General Hospital in Boston. You see? Very big invasion into the brain stem. So we didn't remove completely, but then they hit this part of the skull base with proton beam. We have a very good results in this. I mean, after probably. It's a young girl, 14 years old, uh, who had this. Now, in conclusion, one, I would, I would like to repeat something that was said already. Each patient is the entire world in his or her own reason. This should be respected. We have to have the consent. We have to hear the patient. The patients do not care what will be possible tomorrow. They do not need long discussions. They do need a sound explanation of their situation and how it will be solved. The surgeon should be honest with himself first, recognize his or her own limits, and second, 
with the patient to tell him her not only what is possible, but also what the surgeon can perform. For the patient, the surgeon's yesterday's achievements count significantly less than his today's performance. If I say, you know, I was so good sometimes, who cares? Show me what you can do today, because I'm in question. However, it should not be forgotten that everything is experience relevant. Uh, conclusion two. Nothing is complete. Nothing is definite. Everything is changing. And surgery is not an exception. So what we favor today will be maybe obsolete tomorrow. And we have to be prepared for this. Not to be sad or angry or whatever. No, no. We tried our best. Also, sorry. Also, she is changing through time. And you have to be prepared. We still have some people, I just show a few of them. They are founders of this kind of surgery, you know, Kawase. And then we have a, my dear friend, we have a love hate relationship. You know him. Dr. Demidis. He came now from below, from Splunkrocranium. And he does a, a very good job for many tumors. Pituitary, uh, some other tumors. But I still say that not all meningiomas can be dealt with from below. We have much better uh, control from above. And we have to be aware that we have a, yes, in one intervention, uh, that we have a radio surgery. I was very fortunate because I've been cooperating with uh, Dr. Steiner in uh, Karolinska Hospital when he was still there, and then later on in Charlottesville where I was working a lot, and now. We have uh, every week, every, every second week, we have a, 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 a discussion what to do with this patient and so on. We do favor at least a reduction of the tumor before it is uh, gamma knife. Thank you very much.